together and sing, There is Power in the Blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. There's one. Glad to be in God's house. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Praise the Lord. I came in today and I saw Brother Tom in that nice double-breasted suit smiling. And I know why his mother-in-law is here. God bless you, Miss Walker. We love you. Give her a hand of love. Amen. All the way from the mountains of North Carolina where everybody dips, smokes, or chews. And we're glad you're here. And uh, how many got a request today? The Lord is able to meet our needs. Let's talk to our Heavenly Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, we gather in this room today in the name that is above every name. And I pray for the next few moments we will sit together in heavenly places and you will minister grace and mercy to our hearts. We thank you for this day. Bless everyone that has a need. God, do us today what we can't do for ourselves. And we'll thank you and praise you because we ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said amen. 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 You may be seated. Come on, choir. Sing for us. Amen.
today I've been talking with
serve a risen Savior. Let's stand fellowship a little bit while the choir dismounts. Let somebody know you're glad to see them today in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.
Praise God. Come on, let's sing that chorus. Oh, yes. say amen you're a child of the king amen you go ahead be seated if this is the first time you've been with us thank you so much for joining us today we're excited to have you as part of our uh, guests here and part of the service here at harvest baptist tabernacle want to go through a few things we have a busy week here at our church monday evening we have our push group uh, pray until something happens right here tomorrow's the 14th of August at 7 p.m. you come and be a part of that service we'll have a great time or a good time of prayer time uh, so thankful for brother Brian Moats heading that up and doing that he's done such a wonderful job with that and uh, we thank God that we can pray then the second thing that we have coming on this week well we do have Wednesday uh, midweek services so you come out and be a part of that we do have our Wednesday morning and our Wednesday evening services and in all the programs that are here on Wednesdays. Then, of course, on the 17th of August, the Young at Heart, they're going to be having a luncheon. So, you Young at Heart people, if you'd like to do that, uh, Southern Pit Barbecue. Praise God. Hall <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody say an amen to that. I like it. So, uh, Southern Pit Barbecue, they're going to be going down there at 1 o'clock on the August the 17th. So, come out 1 o'clock there. Then, of course, we have our Lasting Love Marriage class that will be coming up on the 18th of August, and uh, we're excited about that. Uh, Stephanie and Brother Joe Kramer have been doing such a wonderful job with that and uh, been a great week uh, every time that we've seen that. Then, of course, Saturday, we do have our summer saturation, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Come out be a part for the remainder of this month. We've had such a wonderful job, wonderful turnout, and so thankful for all of you that showed up to be a part of that. And uh, so excited about knocking on those doors, telling people about Jesus Christ and about Harvest Baptist Tabernacle to come and be a part. All right, hey, amen. Well, let's go ahead and let's receive our tithes and offering this morning. And, I, and one more time, visitors, thank you for coming and being a part. If you have a moment, fill out one of those visitor cards, return it. I think we ought to give them a hand for being here today. Thank you so much for that. Let's go ahead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all your blessings that you've given to each and every one of us. Thank you for the ability to be able to give this morning. And God, I pray that you just touch in the remainder of this service. God, I pray that you'd be with the offering. God, I pray that you'd bless the giver. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the gift and multiply it. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd be with our pastor as he preaches this morning. Be with the song service. God, thank you for what we've already felt. And Lord, we fail not to praise you, God, for what you've done. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. And amen. name the name of Jesus there is no other name amen the, the most wonderful name well we've had our young people home from college for the summer and most of them are getting ready to head back uh, out of town and to, to classes and I've had so many requests for this I called these three this week and said y'all be ready to sing Sunday morning so this is by many requests we'll call them the college trio now <laughs> Yeah. 
many are they increased that trouble me many are they that rise up against me many there be which say of my soul there is no help there is no help for him in god but thou o lord are a shield for me my glory and the lifter of my somebody last night and I said I'm kind of dreading tomorrow I said we was on the mountaintop so high last Sunday we might hit the bottom today but I believe we're picking up right where we left off what a mighty God we serve and he is worthy of our praise Revelation chapter number one we laid a little foundation last week and as the Lord leads and guides and directs we're going to be looking at these 22 chapters, 26 beholds and 7 blesseds, what John saw in the book of the Revelation, the glory, the splendor, the majesty of God's unfolding plan of redemption. And I'm glad many time you look at the Word of God in Jesus Christ, it is a sight to behold. The songwriter said, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. 
why he would love me, a sinner, condemned and unclean. And I'm not the only one in this room today that marvels at the grace of God. God, who is sovereign and absolute righteous, would include us in his plan. And just because we may be unworthy, we don't have to be unthankful. And I'm glad for the greatness of our God. Last week, we gave you three words that begin with B, that unlock the treasures of the book of the Revelation. In this book of the Revelation, John saw the book. And beside the little word book, write down God's divine plan. And may I remind you today that the Lord is always 17,000 steps ahead of the world and the devil. And let me remind you that God's train is still running on time. And as he saw the book, he saw God's divine plan. And then we gave you another word, the bride. He saw the bride. And beside of that word, you write down God's divine people. He saw the church. From the time of its birth in Holy Ghost power at Pentecost to the days of apostasy till it's raptured out of this world. And may I just add, somebody said the church is going down. No, it's not. Church is going out, going up, because we're the body. He's the head. The head is seated in heaven, and we're going to where our head is one day. He saw the book, God's divine plan. He saw the bride, God's divine people. But I'm interested today in several weeks to that third B word, the word beloved, he saw the beloved. In the sight of that word, you write down God's divine person. And he tells us in the opening part of the book, it's not the revelation of St. John the divine. It is not the revelation of Pope Pius the 14th or the 15th. It's not the revelation of Brother Joe Arthur. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about who he is and what he has done, what he is doing and what he will do. And I want us to take our time as we plod through this first chapter because I want you to get a glimpse, uh, get a glimpse of the beloved, God's divine person, as John did in the book of Revelation, especially this first chapter. I'm not trying to be repetitious, but I mentioned this last Sunday. It has been my goal. For almost 39 years, not for you to ever, ever leave this building and say, what a preacher. That has never been my goal. But for 39 years, it has been my goal that every time you leave these premises, whether Brother Arthur's preaching or Brother Tom or Brother Shane or whoever's preaching, you leave this place saying, oh, what a Savior. Because if you forget the pastor and the staff and the leadership, no big deal. If you forget the choir, if you forget the singers, if you forget the Sunday school teacher, you know, no big deal. But if you forget Jesus and you miss him, you miss it all. It ought to be the goal every time this choir mounts that platform, folks, to see Jesus. It ought to be the desire of every Sunday school teacher. When you stand in front of your class for the next 35 minutes, they see Jesus. And every preacher that graces this platform, their goal, their desire ought to be, show them Jesus. Because Jesus Christ didn't used to be the answer. He's not going to be the answer, and he's not one of the many different answers. Christ is the answer. And we get a great glimpse of this divine person in Revelation chapter number 1, I'm going to remind you I'm not going to be in a hurry. I plan on staying at least three or four more weeks, and so we're going to plod our way through this chapter. I want you to begin today in chapter 1 in verse 5. And I'm mindful of the clock, and the Lord willing, I will stop somewhere around 5 to 12 or so. I want you to make sure you beat the Methodists and the Presbyterian and the Southern Baptists in the food line. Say amen right there. But I want to just take my time and prod through this. 
you'll get a glimpse of Jesus Christ, the revelation, God's divine person, who's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, which was, which he is to come. And I don't know of any greater description than somebody that can say I'm the first and the last and that which was and which is and which is to come. I believe when you say that, you've said it all. Jesus. Notice what it said in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5. Notice this glimpse of God's divine person. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And I want you to look at verse number five at this wonderful revelation of Jesus Christ. And notice it says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the of the earth. I want to stop and say what a description. What a name. I thought about several subtitles we could put on the message today. We could preach on what a name. We could preach on the glorious name of Christ. We could even use one of the songs we've sang through the years. There is something about that name. Or we could use the Bible term from Paul's epistle to the Philippian believer, a name that is above every name. We could say the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, hallowed be thy name. We could use one of the gospel songs we sang through the years, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. But no matter what title you put on this, make sure you find out today you know who I'm talking about. The revelation of Jesus Christ. I want us to look at the first part of verse number five at this glorious name. Who is God's divine person and who is he and what is his name and what is his title? And I want to work very methodically down through verse number 5 and preach on every single word in that first part of that verse. I'm feeling a spell coming on, children. It's wonderful. Let's look at the first title, the first part of his name in verse 5. And from Jesus. Just stop right there. Take a text. Jesus. Did you know if that's the only word I said today, that'd be enough? Jesus. I just like the way that sounds. Jesus. Do you know him? Do you love him? Do you appreciate what he's done in your life? Jesus. Second word, Christ. Not just Jesus, but Jesus Christ. Not some frivolous Jesus, but Jesus Christ. Listen to this line. Who is? You say, how in the world can you preach on that phrase? Who is? Because he is. You say, well, who is he? I'm trying to tell you. Jesus Christ. Where is he? He's where he always has been. What is he? Oh, boy, now you're opening up a book. What is he? He is good. He is light. He is holy. He is faithful. How many is's do you need? Let me say it like this. Whatever you need, he's got an is to fix it. Whatever you is, he's better than your is. Glory. Who is the faithful witness? Listen to the, the first begotten of the dead. And when you think it can't get any better, he calls him not just the king, but the prince of the kings of the earth. And let's just take a little stroll down and preach on that name that is above every name. 
Let's look at his first description in chapter 5 and verse 1. And from, said with me, Jesus. And beside of that, write down this word. He is the saving one. What a name, the name of Jesus. You know where he got that name? That's what the angels told Mary and Joseph to name that virgin-born son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. And they explain why. Because he shall save his people from their sins. And that's what the name Jesus literally means in the Arabic. It means the Savior of the people. In the Old Testament, that name under the Hebrew language is pronounced Joshua. And in the Arabic of the New Testament, it's pronounced Jesus. And it means the Savior of the people. Look how that word was used in the Old Testament. That was a group of people called the Israelites. And they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years under the leadership of this man named Moses who represents the law of God. You say, well, do you have any scripture for that? Well, how about the book of John chapter number 1 and verse 17 where it says, And the law was given by Moses. And as Moses leads them through the wilderness of temptation, the wilderness of sin, the wilderness of lust, the wilderness of backsliding, the wilderness of judgment and condemnation, it seems like for 40 years they are trapped by a river called Jordan. And, and I mean, even though they're not in the Egyptian bondage, they're not a whole lot better off because they've still not reached the full blessing and the full promise of God. God did more than promise to bring them out of the land of Egypt. God promised them to do more than that. To do more than free them from Egyptian bondage, God promised to bring them to a land of rest, a land that flows with milk and honey. Everywhere Abraham had put his foot, God said, that's where I'm going to take you. But boy, they are trapped in this wilderness of judgment and lust and depression and sin and backsliding. And for 40 long years, they can't seem to take the next step. And there's a New Testament verse that tells you why. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak. And by the way, now you can't find fault with Moses. He was a friend of God. He was a man of God. And he was God's appointed leader at that time. He was a servant of God. He was a mouthpiece for God. He was greatly used of God. But because he represents the law, he can only take those people so far. He can tell them how bad Egypt is and how wicked Pharaoh is and tell them that sin had enslaved them. And he can even introduce them to a blood-slain lamb that will pay the price for their exodus. But that is the best he can do, and for 40 years all he does is wander in this border of the wilderness. And one day Mr. Law breathes his last breath, and God smothers him to death with Holy Ghost kisses on top of Mount Nebo. And right there on a mountain, and if you miss this, you've missed it all. Right there on a mountain, a hilltop. Right there on a mountain, a hilltop. Right up there on a mountain at a hilltop, God makes, not Moses, not Israel, but God makes a transition. He removes Mr. Law off of the scene totally. And at the foot of the mount, at the foot of the hill, the sovereign God of heaven takes the keys of fulfillment from Mr. Perfect Law 
and he hands it to a young man, 33 years old at that time, at the foot of the mountain with a trumpet in one hand and the plan of God in the other hand by the name of Joshua, which means Savior. And in seven days, my God, somebody help me. And within seven days, the Savior, Joshua, accomplishes what Mr. Law could not do for 40 years. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You say, but I don't get it. Well, let me try to help you get it. The law told us how bad sin was and what it's done to the hearts and lives of people and it can even introduce us to a lamb, to a savior and tell us all about him but cannot get us across that river to the next step to the land that flows with milk and honey but at a mountain called Calvary the sovereign God of heaven took the rite of passage from Mr. Law and he gave it to Mr. Grace the Savior and in seven hours Jesus did what the law could not do for the past 4,000 years years saved us, redeemed us, emancipated us, delivered us. Hallelujah. No wonder the angels said, call him Jesus. Woo. For he shall save his people from their sins. And no wonder the Bible said, and every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Then don't you get mad at me. If you want to end your prayer in thy name, say it. If you want to end your prayer in, in thy name, thy holy name, thy wonderful name, hallelujah, just pray. I ain't knocking it. But if you really want to ring the bell and see God Almighty smile, say more than, Lord, in thy name we pray. Why don't you just go ahead and step out on the limb and say, in Jesus' name, amen. Because when Peter and John went up to the temple and that lame man was laying at the gate asking of alms, that, that crippled man said, alms, alms. And Simon Peter, being a Baptist preacher, said, silver and gold, have I none? You'll get that after a while. But he, but he threw this in, but such as I have. Some of these old timers will remember this name back years ago called Hinkle Little. Hank Alula was from uh, Taylorsville, North Carolina. He passed it where my friend, Brother Dagonar, has been almost 40 years. My brother Hank Alula, he was good friends with Julie's grandfather, and they traveled those hills through that country. And brother Hank Alula would say, Paul said uh, to that man at the gate, uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. Brother Hinkle used to say, I really don't know what that such as I have means, but you need to get you some of that such as I am before you leave here tonight. But such as I have, give I thee. And he did not say in thy name, the holy name, the awesome name. No, he just went out there and said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk friend of mine the other day got a call from a politician and said brother so and so we want you to come to the state house and uh, read a verse from the Bible and, and have a quick word of prayer over the session he said man I, I've always wanted to do that and, and, and man I'm telling you right now I, I, I'll be glad to do it I'll cancel whatever I got to do it he said but now pastor there is one requirement you can talk about God you can talk about the Lord. You can talk about the Heavenly Father. But you cannot mention the name Jesus. 
You cannot pray in Jesus' name. He said, get you somebody else to pray over your little ignorant political party because without Jesus, I can't pray. Without Jesus, I wouldn't know God. Without Jesus, I wouldn't know the Heavenly Father. May I remind you this morning, if you don't pray in Jesus' name, you're wasting your time of praying. If you don't approach God in Jesus' name, you're wasting your time approaching God. If you try to preach without Jesus' name, you're wasting your time of preaching. If you try to offer salvation to a lost and a dying world without the name of Jesus, you're wasting your time. I've come to tell you today there's authority in the name of Jesus. There's hope in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. There's preciousness in the name of Jesus. There's majesty in the name of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He is the saving one. Jesus. You say, well, Reverend Arthur, I'm here today, and every time I hear that word, it turns, it tires my Nerves up, man too. Jesus. Turn to somebody beside of you right now and say, Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? What a name. The saving one. Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Look at the second title. Christ. I mean, if Jesus was all that was there, that would be enough. But he said he's Jesus Christ. Beside of that little word right down, he's not only the saving one, but he is the selected one. Or if you really want to get technical, he is the single one. Because there's no other Christ, there's no other Jesus, there's no other Savior besides him. You say, what does that word Christ mean? Well, you can't hardly mention what I'm about to mention in a Baptist church without them thinking you're some kind of fanatic, but you're just going to have to think what you want to think. The word Christ literally means the anointed. By the way, can I clear off some real estate? The word anointed is not a holiness word. It's not a Christian word. It is not a Baptist word. It's a God word. And the word anointed just simply means divinely favored and chosen and set apart. It literally means the chosen Christ, the anointed Christ, the selected Christ, the single Christ, the only Christ, Christ the Messiah. Not a Messiah, not some Messiah, but the Messiah. The anointed of God, the chosen of God, the selected of God. Ladies and gentlemen, can I remind you, when God got ready to redeem lost humanity, he did not send an angel. He sent Christ. When God got ready to redeem lost humanity, he did not send a prophet. He did not send a priest. He did not send a Moses. He did not send an Elijah. He did not send an Abraham. He did not send a Paul or a Peter or a John the Baptist. But ladies and gentlemen, when God got ready to redeem lost humanity to himself, he chose, he selected, he anointed the only Savior, the only Messiah, and it's Jesus Christ. And if you want to say it the other way around, it means the same thing, Christ Jesus. How many of you love the Bible? I love it when it says Jesus Christ. I like it when it said the Lord Jesus Christ. I even like it when it says Christ Jesus the Lord. And I really get blessed when Paul says the Christ of God. Several years ago, I was trying to fly out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And I've come to the conclusion, if you can drive there in three hours, just do that. 
Delta, D-E-L-T-A. Do not expect luggage to arrive because all the good guys have quit. And I was standing there in the Charlotte International Airport. And these three ladies, late teens, early 20s, were standing there, and as I walk up, they all go, oh, 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 yes. And I'm like, glory. Amen. Hadn't had that reception in a while. Amen. And I was about to really enjoy like, hey, the old man still got it. And I said, hi. They went, oh, move out of the way, old man. Look behind you. And I looked behind me. And here come this mammoth guy. I mean, he, he got muscles on top of muscles. And I mean, he was like, I even went, wow. And I said to this little girl, I said, who is that? She said, sir, you mean to tell me you don't know who that is? And I said, honey, if I don't know who Boyntz is, I sure don't know who this dude right here is. She said, oh, you don't know. And I said, no, tell me. I thought you were ooming and gooing over me. She said, no, you remind me of my grandfather. I said, who is that? She, I mean, this girl was about to go into the DTs. I mean, she was sweating. She had goosebumps. Ever. She said, oh, my, that's the anointed one. That ain't him, honey. She said, don't argue with me. I've, I've seen him wrestle. I said, I've been around the two with him myself, and that ain't him. She said, but I got his card. I said, I got a whole book. That ain't him. She said, but I got his autograph. I said, I do too. And I'm telling you, that ain't him. She said, but he's beat everybody that's ever come against him. I said, you're getting close. <laughs> she said, he's feared. I said, you're getting a little bit closer. I said, honey, did he go to the cross and die for your sins? And she must have been, she said, no, Jesus did that. I said, that's the best thing, honey, you said all morning. Let me tell you, he is not the anointed one. He is not the Christ. He is not the Messiah. I don't care if he did whoop nature boy Ric Flair. I know somebody that whoops somebody bigger than nature boy and all of the others. He's Jesus Christ, the Christ, the anointed the chosen, the selected. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. You can't outlove him. You can't outgive him. You can't outdo him. You can't outgive him. You can't outlive him. You can't outpower him. He is all in all above all. His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. He's the selected one. He's the saving one I still got five minutes Jesus Christ what's the next phrase in the text you missed one who he is he is but what's that third title? Jesus Christ, who is, said with me, the faithful witness. Right down beside of that, the sinless one. You say, well, what does that term mean, and why is it so special? The faithful witness. Well, let's dissect that. What is a witness? Well, he is somebody who has seen something. Mm. He is somebody that's experienced something. He is somebody who knows something. 
that has somebody else's destiny and future in the palm of his hand. And whether you're the prosecuting attorney or the advocating attorney, it is your sole responsibility to make all the witnesses on both sides look bad. Let's say Brother Tom is brought before this court and let's say Brother Daniel's going to come and, and I'm going to say, is he a good man? Are you sure? Well, how good are you? And I start trying to tear you down because I'm really trying to tear him down. And then here comes his accuser. And the accuser is saying, he did this, he did this, he did that. But I'm his advocate. He did, huh? He is, huh? Do you mean he's sorry? Did you say that? Low down? Good for nothing? Guilty? Who are you? Who are you? You don't have any right to tell nobody. I know you and him. You both are low down and sorry. Whatever side you're on, either the opposing or the defense, your job is to tear down the witness. Because if I can tear down the witness, I got him. If I can say, you, sir, excuse me, are an unreliable witness, or if I can say, you have brought false charges, this, somebody help me. This man's fate is determined on what side does the best job in tearing down their witness somebody that could stand and beside of him and say I was there I saw it either good or bad and boy there have been some very unreliable witnesses there have been some people that stood before a court as a witness and they were more sorry and guilty than the person that was being tried well that was a courtroom one day and God Almighty was the judge of righteousness. And they bring in old brother Tom Allen. And the prosecuting side gets up and says, he was born of sinful man. He's broke the law of God. He's forgot the blessings of God. He's guilty of the murder of the Son of God in the first degree. But the advocate gets up on the other side and said, but wait a minute. A price has been paid and a demand has been been met ladies and gentlemen he is worth saving and we're going to pardon him we're going to forgive him because his witness is reliable he is the faithful witness he has destroyed the opposition he has destroyed the accuser and I stand and say on the basis of that witness he is forgiven Thank you, Brother Tom. You say, what has that got to do with Jesus Christ? Can you give me three minutes and I will answer that question? The devil drug you before a holy thrice God and said he's sorry, he's low down, he curses, he swears, he doubts, he fears, he questions, he lusts, he wants, and he murdered your son at Calvary and shed his blood on an old cruel cross. Chuck him in hell. But the faithful witness the reliable witness steps up and says, I paid the price. I lived the sinless life. I shed my blood. I put it on the mercy seat. And God said, I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, my God, somebody help me right here. Do you know what a faithful witness is? He is somebody that's got somebody's fate in their hand and the righteous judge can believe every word that he said. I think I may have give that definition too quick. Let me slow down and breathe. A faithful witness is someone 
whom the judge believes every word that he said. And ladies and gentlemen, you start with Adam in the garden and go to John the Revelator in the book of the Revelation. And every one of them wonderful, famous Bible characters has a flaw. Oh, do they have flaws. Hmm. Can I just say this? That's some messed up people in the Bible. And if you think your family is dysfunctional, whoo, read the book of Genesis. There are some, I'm telling you, I'd make a reality TV show. But ladies and gentlemen, when you examine Jesus Christ, you ask Abraham, who's that? He'll lie and say, it's my sister, when it's really his wife. Ask Simon Peter, do you know him? No, nope, I ain't never met him a day in my life. I don't know him. He may tell you a fib. Ask Thomas. He says, I don't know. I don't believe none of it. But ask Jesus Christ, and whatever he says, you can believe and depend on every word. He is the faithful witness. In other words, when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, no man cometh to the Father but by me, believe it. When he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, for I am the Father, are one, believe it. When he said, before Abraham was, I am, believe it. When he said, I am the resurrection and the life, believe it. When he said, I am the true vine, believe it. When he said, I am the bread, I am the water, I am the good shepherd, I am that I am. Ladies and gentlemen, in a world where you don't know where to turn or who to trust, you can believe every word of the reliable witness, Jesus Christ. One day the disciples said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if you want to go see the Father, follow the Son. We're going to get them other two tonight. But let me give you a parting shot. I was reading the other day an article about the Battle of Atlanta. And Sherman left here and went to the sea, and them Yankees beat us. I'm trying to start it again and see if we can turn that thing around. John Hamblin and Brian McBride, my two Yankee preacher friends, say they called Georgia conquered territory. They ain't going to start nothing else. They know who's packing. <laughs> but they said at the height of that awful time in our country, staying outside of the White House gate was a young man. And he said to that guard, I need to talk to President Lincoln. I've got a word from my mama to give our, her son and my brother that's fighting at Shiloh and I need to talk to President Lincoln. That guard said, no, 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 no. You're not allowed in here. And the boy began to weep and the boy began to cry and the, and the guard even felt sorry for me. He said, son, I can't help it. It's protocol. You can't go in. And about that time, as he turned to walk away, behind the gate was a little boy, his age, 12, and went, psst. He walked over there and looked through those bars and said, yes. He said, do you really want to see President Lincoln? Do you really want to tell him in person what your mama wants him to hear? He said, with all of my heart, he said, you go back up there to that gate. That little boy went back up there to that gate. 
And that guard stuck his hand, and when he did, that little 12-year-old boy stepped around that guard, reached across the line, and grabbed that little boy by the hand and said, Come with me. That guard said, Okay. And some there walking up the steps to the White House. That little old boy is enthroned. He's going to meet the president in a few moments. He's going to get to talk to him face to face and tell him firsthand what his mama said. And that little boy, as he's walking with that other little boy up them steps, he said, man, I don't understand it. They turned me away three times, but I'm holding your hand and we're walking into the house. He said, son, that's my daddy. President Lincoln is my daddy. And a friend of mine is a friend of daddy's. And he walked him in the Oval Office and said, Daddy, this, oh dear God, have I got to explain. I wanted to know God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but the heavenly guard said, you're sinful, you're wicked, and you're not allowed. But I heard a voice from bloody Calvary say, Psst, follow me, and I'm holding the hand of the Son, and the Son ushered me into the presence of the sovereign God of heaven. He is the faithful witness. Jesus Christ. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. Let's stand together, Lord. We love you today. What a name. What a title. What a Savior. We give you praise and we give you glory. Thank you. Lord, for those that are in this room today that do not know you as their personal Savior, they have absolutely no hope of heaven and hell is their home when they leave this world. Draw them by thy Holy Spirit. Introduce them to your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, for those of us who name your name and claim your name, May we love you, serve you, worship you, praise you, and lift you high. Because, Lord, you made all of your people a promise that if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men. Thank you, Lord, for the magnetism of the cross. We give you glory in Jesus' name. While they're playing, get ready to sing.